welcome uh, to the series of talks on Q time learning framework. Today's talk is a talk about learning in the method dimension. So today's talk is about what you can learn as methods that is available in every aspect of learning. So we have gone through the very first class about the introduction of um, Q time learning and the second class was about uh, the learning in trust dimension and the third class was about learning in innovation dimension. So today's talk is going to be learning in method dimension. So before we get into learning in method dimension, I would like to re quickly recap on what exactly is Q-time learning for the benef benefit of those who are watching this separately. So Q-time learning is a paradigm shift. Uh, I go through the process of uh, touching upon some of the salient features of Q-time learning. So one of those, a couple of those are away from implicit learning which is linear in nature. So that is the current existing fashion of learning. You enter as kindergarten, exit with some degrees in your degree in your hand. And this model is from a different era. It is not applicable for 21st century. There are other means or other ways to learn. And uh, this promotes a learning aspect which is continuous and cyclical and also promotes the fact that there is no starting point. You can start anywhere. Going down further, it is it tries to achieve a completeness in learning. So we have talked about what is learning. It is learning some new or uh, modifying the existing knowledge, behavior, skills, preferences, values, all that. So this is a completeness in learning and also treats the knowledge as one. And knowledge and skill are both uh, two sides of a coin. So you have to understand that both are important. So the next comes the concept of the knowledge itself. How much do you know? So you are bounded by the knowledge you know. You live and act th within that. And this unbound knowledge, which is going to be beyond what is what you know already and that is for there to acquire, for there to know. So and also we have a concept of knowledge itself that you have acquired can shrink or expand depending on the relevancy of that for today. If the knowledge you have acquired some 40 years back is not relevant, it has to be shrunk and you have to acquire a new knowledge. And we believe there is nothing like an educated and uneducated classes. We believe it is going to be one class for one human race, it's educated class. And this particular learning is going to be scalable at individual level, at the group level or team level, at organization levels and going higher up, the society can learn by it, the whole methods, the whole learning techniques and even the nation can do that. So the main core principles or ideas with which the Q-time learning is built is to know about learning quadrants, taking time, the Q-time steps into Q-time dimensions and Q-time learning dimensions itself. So let us look at uh, learning Q-time way and to know something about quadrants we talk about. The idea of quadrants is again to create a continuity. It's a cyclical quadrants. You can start anywhere in any quadrant and continue on. And all the transfers from a knowledge area 1 to knowledge area 2 happens at the boundaries of quadrants. So whatever you learn within that quadrant is within the knowledge perspective of that quadrant. So the retention is also specific to the quadrants and these quadrants can go into multi-dimensional learning aspects too. So look at this quadrants of Q time. We have trust, innovation, effort and method. We already covered learning in trust and innovation dimensions in the previous two classes. Today will be method dimension. 
So these dimensions themselves they expand and shrink as the knowledge expands and shrinks and these individual dimensions themselves have quadrants. So the four dimensional learning has to be done with the Q time steps. So what are they? They have been acquire step, a begin step, a connect step and a discover step. See all these steps are like a, as simple as A, B, C, D to remember them. So these are Q time steps in Q time learning dimensions, they must be taken and there is no starting point, you can start anywhere. And this is kind of a brief outlook or overview of taking Q time steps in Q time dimensions. So we covered the dimensions part of it in many respects, uh, what kind of uh, dimension it is, whether it is a driving dimension, whether it is a driven dimension, or what are the tenets of these dimensions, how do they influence. So we, we, touch, we go through all this in, uh, for every dimension that we uh, learn in that uh, specific dimension we are of a particular lecture. So we talk about driving dimensions and driven dimensions. Here we have trust and innovation dimensions, they drive effort and method dimension. So we have covered or I have covered uh, trust and innovation dimension in the previous two classes. So today's dimension will be method dimension and it is a driven dimension, it is a driven by what you have learnt in the trust and the innovation dimension, right? Are you with me so far? So the tenets of a driven dimension which is uh, method dimension is chaos. So without a chaotic nature that exists wherever you go, where whatever you see, you cannot devise a method. So the methods are devised to deal with the chaotic nature that exists today, whether it is in learning, at work, wherever you go you see some chaotic nature and you would like to devise a method so that it is meaning, meaningful, repetitive and you can deal with it. So the main tenet of a method dimension is a chaos dimension and how do you deal with it? So the methods that you employ or deploy, they have to deal with this chaos and they have to attain a certain level of maturity. So this method dimension has uh, if you have a very highly methodical uh, environment. So all the other dimensions have not that much of an influence there. So when the method is very much followed, a particular way of doing it is followed, there is not much scope for innovation, there is not much effort is needed, there is no need to worry about trust because everybody follows that method. So the, when the method is in a predominantly uh, visible in any environment, all other dimensions have got a lesser impact. So just to recap on the Q time education, we have to understand, we have to know the learning dimensions and learning in multiple dimensions, the learning, the Q time steps, knowing about driving and driven dimensions the tenets of learning dimensions and the influences of learning dimensions. So once you learn or know about these main concepts, so you are into Q-time education. So what is Q-time learning in method dimension? So you know about trust dimension, innovation, now we are method. So the method dimension itself as I had told you before has quadrants. This is learning quadrants. So what are the learning quadrants of method dimension? So the very first learning quadrant of a method dimension is apply. So what do we mean by apply quadrant? So how do you achieve a maturity in up learning in apply quadrant? Whatever you acquire you have to apply it somewhere to remember what you have acquired. But there are methods, there are ways to go about applying your learning. One of the maturity factor of apply, uh, applying any kind of thing you acquire 
is doing some research on that. So, the research is searching a, a specific subject, researching on a specific uh, need is expanding on what you already have know and diving deep into more about discovering what else to learn, what else to know, what else can be derived or gleaned out of that or squeezed out of that. So, when you start doing research, the maturity happens when you start looking into wide, wider aspect of learning. You will be going through the lot of references. Not only the person that you talk to, you go through the articles that are being written, the commentary on the subject that you are researching, the way that people view the same subject around the world. So, all those things constitute research and then you go with a, a specific abstract introduction about what kind of research you are going to do, prove or disprove something or discover something new. So, you go through all that research, everything in, in terms of uh, knowing this wider aspect of learning. So, you leave the maturity level at that. So, the whole process of uh, attaining a maturity in uh, learning in method dimension is to do experiments and observe the results from those experiments, conclude what is or what is not and theorize on that and then go again and see whether the theory really works or not at different settings or not. If so, why? If not, why not? So, this entire process is a an attempt to attain a maturity of certain kind. Other times it happens by trial and error. So, what is a trial and error? You attempt to do something knowing only a little bit about it, not sure of the results, expecting something to happen, do it anyway, maybe they are thinking the risks are small. And, and whatever that you find, the errors is not going to be so big that is going to really ruin you. So, you go ahead and try that. So, improve on it. Sometimes you call it, um, you know, we, we have a certain way of defining that. It is a, we sometimes call it prototype. Certain concept is visualized, created, it's, it happens particularly in the software industry and then expand on it as the core values that we assumed get validated over a period of time. So, that prototype it becomes a real model on which a system can be built. So, what are the level of maturities you need? Training. It is, it is in fact true that training has to be a continuous aspect of learning. Whether you train yourself, whether you take external help. So, that part of training has to be repetitive in nature till such time you attain the mastery over it. Any skill that you take for example, it cannot come in one day. You may know the theory behind that skill. You know how it is applied, but you may have to do it. So, the the level of maturity you achieve depends on how repetitive you are in, how much effort you put on a daily basis to make sure that you master it. There are other aspects of uh, uh, living, uh, getting to the maturity level of in the apply uh, quadrant. So, statistics, when you have masses to deal with that you do not know what really they want, you lean on statistical surveys or uh, some kind of a theories you work with and you 
kind of infer from the sampling of a big uh, mass of uh, 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 people or anything for that matter to really come to a conclusion this is going to be what is for us in the future. This is going to be their thinking. So we, we go through this kind of surveys, ask questions, get to know okay, what people think or get to understand how these things behave and Q and A is like uh, many other times we collect data, analyze data and then we see the trends. So that we leave, when you saw, start seeing the trend and then you can predict on the trend, you reach a level of maturity. So this is a kind of a little uh, uh, concepts that you have to really understand. And this, uh, some of them already exist and you know them, but it is consciously knowing them that they are available to you. And then see, this is the task at hand and which can be applied. And that is where the learning has to happen. So with that, the apply quadrant, the learning and apply quadrant essentially covers the fact, okay, that whatever you are acquired must be applied somewhere or uh, whatever you are acquired must be validated so that you are confident of its outcome. So that is about a learning and apply quadrant. So what are other quadrants? So before, th this is one of those um, uh, things Sir C. V. Raman said in 1969 addressing the young graduates. Success can only come to you by courageous devotion to the task lying in front of you. What do you mean by courageous devotion? Is applying yourself at the task, which means forget distractions, all the idle wishes, and concentrate on the task at hand. And it is the task is going to become interesting and absorbing and rewarding. So the other way to look at it in Thirukkural it says, when failure occurs, of course you have prepared well, you thought okay that you are going to succeed, but there are certain elements that you might have overlooked and the failure occurs, but challenge it with cheerful attitude, do not don't get let down by that, do not get sulked by that. So challenge that failure with a cheerful attitude, yes, with this particular uh, facts that we have done so far, we know that why it failed. So we had to accumulate more facts, we had to accumulate more data, we had to see if this theory works or not in a smaller uh, scale before we apply on a bigger scale. So it is a learning curve and do not be deterred by that. And Sir C. Raman also said, in the developed an industry, you know, we have you know, kind of, you know, like developed a inferiority compl complex. I mean, it is true. Many times I spoke to one of those uh, uh, students uh, yesterday about uh, who have got nine gold medals. And I asked the person, would you be able to share some of your learning in front of the leaders of this um, uh, farmers, leaders in the farming industry? And she said, Oh, I don't know, sir. Whatever I have learned through is the book. I will not know what I will be able to share with them. They are very experienced. They are on the field. See, this is this is not the outlook a person with a nine gold medal should have. Should be going to say yes. This is this is I know, but what else I don't know. What else is important for me to know, for others to know? What can I share? What can I contribute? So we have to have this mindset okay, that this inferiority complex is not going to help us in any way. So what we think uh, this he says, I think what is needed in India today is the destruction of the defeatist spirit. This is told to the young graduates back in 1969, 1970. So 1970, nobody is almost 2014. So, uh, 40, 45 years later, why do we still have this 
not at a very basic level, uh, just the person who has just uh, uh, managed to pass the exams or tests, but a person who has achieved the gold medal award recognition to say that I do not know what I will be doing. So, I think the education itself has to account for such aspects of learning and should be able to support the students in many aspects and the Q-time learning is one such attempt by attempting to expose learning in more than one dimension and share the core values of that dimension so that every person is as conf confident of what the person knows or does not know and then I believe the destruction of the defeatist spirit will happen. So, this is one of the steps that I am uh, promoting on a continuous basis, on a daily basis to everywhere I go around talking about Q-time learning. So, the second quadrant is, is important as the first quadrant, which is a benchmark. Why is it so? The very fact that again one of those uh, little things I got out of uh, C. V. Raman's uh, address to the graduates. He says at 1969 he is the Nobel Prize winner, I can assert without fear of contradiction that the quality of the Indian mind is equal to the quality of any Teutonic, Nordic or Anglo-Saxon minds. So, why do you have that concept that I am not able to think or I am not able to think at that level? So, a Nobel Prize, Nobel laureate was so confidently can say that about the Indian minds. So, the Indian mind should be taking wings from such uh, inspirational uh, messages and go to the heights that we have never reached before. So, has education let us down? Has learning let us down? So, what needs to be done? it is about benchmarking maturity. We have standards everywhere, we have standards locally, we have standards nationally, we have standards internationally for certain things that we uh, try to uh, implement on a daily basis or to discover something new or whether to really get approval or not approval, everything has to to an acceptable standards. That is your benchmark. So, what is the benchmark in education? Is it just that you pass the exam that you are educated? Yes. Are you learn it? I cannot answer the question. Because a learned person is the person who is so confident he says, yes I do know this, I do not know this and I would like to know that. Can you share what you know and try to understand the your concepts of an understanding of a subject to the his level of or her level of uh, understanding and there will be a dialogue, interaction. So, all such benchmarking activity goes activities go on. So, when that happens automatically you set standards, you set standards at higher levels. You have it does not need to be once you start stand locally people recognize that people that is a good standard to that is a best practice. The so best practice becomes a standard or then you have already gets promoted to a national level and then international levels. But to benchmark you, you have to measure. See not quantitatively measuring oh this is good, this is bad, this is better than that or oh, this is best does not really give us uh, impression of what exactly it is. So, the maturity can happen when it is qualitative which means you have to have facts and figures. What are we measuring? Are we measuring the uh, what you call the usefulness of a product? So, how do we measure usefulness? Do we measure it by means of the customer satisfaction? Do we measure it in terms of how well a particular washing machine washes the uh, cloths. Anything you go, you go into the 
aspect of the usefulness. So, you have to decide on what you measure, then why you measure it, then how you would measure it, then go and set standards. This is what it is, this is what is expected, it is what is happening right now. So, when others becomes, it becomes a standard for others to follow. So, there are because of that we have standard setting bodies which is in industry specific and IT we have a lot of uh, uh, different uh, kinds of uh, uh, professional bodies like IEEE, there are other bodies like you know a particular aspect of uh, you know like project management, you have PMI uh, which is project management institute in US, we have uh, other computer uh, membership uh, bodies like you know uh, Computech, ACS, it is all over the world. We have those member, those, those uh, professional bodies act as a conduit or a catalyst to setting standards because they are professionals. So, they become industry specific standards. So, sometimes even standard setting come out of a growth spurt, suddenly some innovation happens, they the whole mass see the value to it and then there is a little uh, shortfall and the or fall back of the entire thing saying okay, it works very well but does not work here. So, someone else who has got the resources, the time and other things will go around to improve on. So, some other, they go on tangentially all different places, it, the growth happens sporadically all over the place and then everyone looks at it, there is something common to it. So, you rationalize the whole process, out of that comes standards. So, then the benchmarking happens at every step of these kinds of process and happens on a daily basis. So, while we have methods, the method itself consists or constitute some of these aspects of learning quadrants, learning apply quadrant, learning benchmark quadrant, what exactly it is, what are they. So, we have uh, as quadrant means there are four of them, this is the third quadrant, this is collaborate a very important method uh, quadrant. See here you, ha you have to understand one thing, the, the, the collaboration is as opposed to competition. See competition is where you have, you have a definite uh, product in mind, you already produced it, a service in mind, then you compete with outside. Collaboration is the process of reaching that level. And sometimes you have this concept of you know like okay, let us not compete, let us collaborate because we find value because you have a value there, you have a value there. So, if we are put together, we get totally a new value, why do not we collaborate rather than competing? So, more often than not, collaboration promotes higher level of learning. So, how do we achieve a maturity in collaboration? The first and foremost thing, the group trust. Hey, we covered this, did not we? We covered this in our trust dimension. So, how do we, how do we establish that uh, group trust, respecting each other, listening to each other, trying to complement each other's uh, you know, strength and weaknesses, creating synergy and all that. So, what, what else? Group dynamics. What is group dynamics? Group dynamics is nothing but a energy levels. Energy levels of the entire group is much higher than the energy level of a single individual member. So, it is like the whole is larger than its parts. So, the dynamics of group dynamics can work wonderful, wonderfully you know in, ter in terms of uh, at, at times in fact, 
when there is a uh, problems that uh, need to be dealt with, there are issues to be you know like um, dealt with, the challenges are many. So once you have a, a group working with a very positive attitude, that, that kind of you know like uh, contributes to the overall growth and overall development of a particular organization or entity. So th there will be issues, the collaboration issues are always there. There is, there is always uh, uh, contractual terms that you may have to go through, or regulatory policies that you deal with, complementary you know like uh, the value, how do you attach value, how much value do you attach, who wins what, who gets what in the end. So it has to be kind of sorted out in the beginning to, to know that the process of collaboration starts on a right footing. So it is important to understand that collaboration versus competition, uh, the, the differences between that. One is working together to a common purpose. So competition is again working towards a common purpose. but competing to show that your product or services are of a much higher value than your competitor. You are trying to put the product together or wrap the whole package it in such a way okay, that it gets appealing to the person or to the per person who are using it in a much better fashion than the other person. So the same could be the same product. But it, the marketing of that product comes into a foreplay when there is competition in, in, the, in, the, in the mix. But if you do not have competition, when you are collaborating, you are adding value. So whenever there is an innovation has to happen, the collaboration is the best kind of vehicle to uh, board. Competition may kill innovation sometime or may promote innovation sometime, but it is again a thing that uh, like a skating a thin ice. So I would personally feel collaboration is a much more uh, preferred way of uh, innovating the existing products and services. So if any products and services do not come uh, into the market from nowhere. So lot of thinking, lot of planning, lot of consumption of resources, everything goes into that. So there is a process that they follow, they follow a workflow process, the automated processes, they all come together, they are orchestrated in such a way the product you visioned, the product you planned for or you designed gets into the market. So the, the process design is very important to really make sure the product reaches the market the way you wanted it to reach the market. And the alignment of process is important because you need the maximum collaboration internally so and also externally. So when the product is not aligned to customer expectation, when the services are not aligned to your internal thinking what it should be, there will be a gap. Once there is a gap, what happens? Questions arise. So once questions arise, what happens? Someone has to provide answers. The whole process will eat away the, the, the important time within which the product has to be delivered so that it can be useful. So the window of opportunity that you had of six months of delivery may actually come to one month of delivery because of all the other things happening, non-alignment. So the collaboration, collaborative maturity happens when the process design gets aligned. When the differences between the collaboration and competition, the purpose, the way that you go about conducting those uh, are, are properly understood. The collaboration issues are understood. Underst you to understand the whole is larger than its parts to create the group dynamics and the group trust that is needed to produce uh, that service or a product. 
So, the method dimension is uh, stress, method dimension really stresses a lot of importance like the, the, this particular quadrant as the most important for 21st century. See, it is, it is, it is, it is uh, because of the connectivity which is happening around the world. If you have this person in part A or, or, or this part of the country, other person in another, another part of the world, we can still collaborate with the technologies that is available today. So, earlier it was not possible. So, it is possible today. So, make use of it. So, the other uh, a concept of uh, maturity happens when the skill development processes become matured enough to become models that can be implemented. Right now, right now in India, there is a big shortage of skills, there is a skill gap in every industry possible. So, how are they addressing that? So, they are addressing in terms of creating or adopting models that have worked in a particular fashion in any part of the world and it is applicable or not to India. Is it going to prove useful to us or not? Right? So, we have to have that concept of adopting the models from anywhere in the world. So, we, in the right now, we have got Swiss models, we have models from US uh, community college models and all the other, and then they are being rationalized for Indian conditions too. So, the skill development processes uh, then reach a level of maturity and they become models to be used. So, this is this are the important steps in creating or uh, reaching the methods maturity. So, then we have this uh, the last quadrant, the last quadrant in the method dimension is deliver. Why is it? Why is it deliver or uh, deliver is a learning quadrant? So, it is important to know that these things are possible. So, the ideas come and go, oh I can do this, I can do that, but can you deliver? So, it is important for you to know that any idea that you go on the spring from this corner of the world or that corner and you come to know about it, it has to be implemented, it has to be delivered. So, there is a method to deliver the product or service. There are so many methods that they, they, there are so many that you can think of and then you get the method to madness. What is that? You know, when you see the chaotic nature, you naturally inclined to get uh, a, some kind of a method in place to deal with it, right? So, we always call it method to madness, but how do we do this? We do this by designing processes that can work or can work for the majority of that chaotic nature you see there and you engage in activities to really make it happen, right? So, there, there is a method to madness means that you design, create, discover processes and you improve on the process, your process mining and the activities that you engage in to deliver that. And the theory of chaos means that there is a thing called um, a push and pull energies in play. You, you have to, when you have to have a change or when there is a change, some changes are um, resistant to the people who are not going to accept it. So, they say oh this, this change is going to be like you know mind blowing and is going to really upset my the whole daily schedule and everything and this is going to really uh, put me off the charts, I do not want to really uh, go through this. So, they fear the change. So, then how do you, how do you deal with that? So, wherever you have that fear, you have end up in a chaotic nature of uh, chair, the implementation of new system or new uh, products or services. So, we will deal with the push and pull energies. 
So you push the people away from their old habits and try to pull them to the new way of thinking. You create synergies by trying to direct those like thinking other way around and putting them in separate training sessions, education sessions and create synergy towards the change. So the chaotic nature of that is kind of managed to the extent that the whole momentum takes place towards the new change that you are looking forward to implement. And then in any organization you have to always work in terms of internal delivery, how do you take care of your own uh, staff, employees, what do they expect and externally what kind of customers, the, what do they want from you and you have to do on an organic basis, on a continuous basis. Organic means it is a living thing. You have to believe that the entire organization is a living thing. So once you believe that you can deliver the highest quality of services or products. So it is important for us to really understand the maturity of deliver or learning in delivery happens when you understand such little things about uh, chaos, things about madness in the whole process and deal with it. See there are, there are institutions who deliver things for you. So the government delivers things for you through policies, through regulations they control certain aspects of delivery. They enact laws. Those control mechanisms have to they have to exist there to make sure the delivery happens, right? And, and the private organizations, they go work through the policies and guidelines. So the, 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 they have a, they don't, they cannot really say this is, this is a company policy. Why do they say that? Because they know with that policy, they will be able to deliver the best quality of service. Are they able to they can give best help that they can. But if you are not happy with the company's policy for whatever reason, okay, then of course you are going to choose another company. But there will be a section of a group of people that will be still be happy with the company's policy and they deal with the company's products and services. And some of the guidelines are issued so that if there is an exceptional conditions are met, some guidelines going to help you to deal with those exceptions to some extent. So the, the delivery happens through these mechanisms in the private organizations. NGOs, how do they deliver? They deliver, the del they, their important delivery is service and also fill the need which is not you know, met by any other government or a private organizations because government is is controlled by public and they have got that uh, their own agenda to deal with it and they have, they have to deal with the political system that uh, cater that really restricts or constricts or really helps or promotes uh, the whole process and the private organizations exist exist they exist there is a business for profit but in between that there is a mass who can suffer and get does not get the what you call needed thing that they are looking for and both of them are not able to do that then the NGOs come into play they feel the need, they understand what needs to be done. There are many foundations around the world. In India, I believe you have one NGO per 600 Indians. So you have that kind of a uh, existence to deliver some of the services and products that is, uh, that is just to fill the need. And of course, education is delivered through schools and colleges and universities. There are alternate systems existing. You know, like you have a you have a primary school that government comes up with some kind of a uh, curriculum that that they ins insist that should be uh, you know delivered to the students. Are those primary schools is government controlled or private controlled or whatever? The alternate school system is basically like something totally different. There are some there are five or six uh, school systems existing in the world, and they still exist for many reasons. Montessori is one of them. They have a different kind of schooling compared to the normal schooling that you see. And they are, some of these schools adopt a different model. 
and there are some outreach programs to reach those who are not able to attend schools. How do you reach them? They are, in, they are the farthest kind of the thing, they, are, they don't have the transportation, they are nomadic in nature, maybe tribal. So you reach them through outreach programs. So normal educational channels won't work. You deliver education by some other means. And nowadays to 21st century deliver education through e-learning mechanisms, online classes, online tuitions and online content. In fact, there is a uh, NGO in Karnataka which is IT for change. They are creating content for middle school. They are creating content so that you know that the teachers can create those content themselves using public software and that is available to students which is basically a, a little uh, extra that they can look into or reference to outside the curriculum that is set for the middle school students by the government. So society again delivers certain things. How do, how do they deliver? They deliver through value systems, the culture it builds, the traditions that it follows. So some of the traditions become very mature and is practiced widely. Some of the cultures are accepted because they have values in it. The societies deliver that. So the delivery mechanism you have to understand that those things reach maturity over a period of time or over a well thought uh, process that is in place or highly educated masses who can follow that process and know the benefits of following that. So when the maturity happens, the all the delivery that is intended delivery reaches the intended audience. So, but whatever you deliver, products or services, you should know that this difference. See, product is the one which you can feel, which you can see, which you can taste. But service is not like that. Just imagine service is invisible. So when you are delivering services, the same thinking or thought process that you use or adopt to deliver a product may work or may not work. So we have to have such uh, what we call recognition of the differences between the products and services. The service is invisible. You have to create an image of yourself that you are a good consultant. How do you do that? that you are a good provider of a service. How do you do that? By quality of service, by commitment or devotion you show to the work that you do. You say this is what I am going to deliver and you deliver that. So that service actually has got a certain intonation for understanding what maturity is. So, most of the times, you know, when you, are, when, you, when you work towards the maturity level, I find it many times they run pilots. Well, pilots are either locally uh, confined or it is on a small scale or it is experimental in nature so that the risks and the, and the advantages can be analyzed ahead of time and then see extrapolate that mathematical for you know like my plast, uh, uh, what are called, uh, uh, formulas or whatever they use to really see how big the risk going to be. So the pilots are also essential way of delivering certain aspects of uh, services and products and the most important thing is governance of all that to make sure the delivery happens. So everything, every quadrant in this method dimension, apply quadrant, benchmark quadrant, collaborate and also the finally deliver. All quadrants are equally important to learn and to master. So the maturity of methods happens only when these 
learning happens in these quadrants. You know, this is one of those beautiful quote from uh, Abraham Lincoln. Determine that things can and shall be done and then we shall find the way. It is, it is one of those, uh, you know, the mindset that everyone should have. What can be done? What shall be done? So think about that, determine that first and we will find the way. Larry King is one of those uh, interviewers on the US television network in CNN, CNN all of you may know. He, when he came to US or before coming to US, he thought the streets and foot, footpaths of US are laid in gold. That is that's a kind of a image the US had created for the immigrants. But when he landed there, there was nothing like that. But then he found the opportunities exist to do that, if you want to do that. That is what is needed. So, determine that things can and shall be done and then we shall find the way. That is the most important quote I have and a beautiful quote I think still applies today. So, another thing you know this is uh, I found in one of the books I read Ignited Minds by Abdul Kalam, our ex-president. He says it is essential that technologies that give immediate benefits to the people must be taken up, must be taken up for implementation and it should be taken up regardless of which party is in power. So this is, this is delivery on its purest terms. The essential nature of that, the technology nature of that, the immediate benefits nature of that and who it is for that all in put place and by system, not by any political intervention, not by political po parties in power. So, this is how you can deliver things, it can be done. So, overall the methods maturity you reach or attain this method maturity when you complete the learning in the apply quadrant, in the benchmark quadrant, in the collaborate quadrant and deliver quadrant understand what they are, wh why they are for and again I told you this entire dimension is can be expanded or can be shrunk. You can start anywhere in the st uh, start, no starting point as such, you can start in deliver quadrant and then discover what can be applied in benchmark and again go around whichever way you want it. So all the learning in these quadrants will help you to attain a maturity in the methods that you adopt or you devise or implement or follow. So this is my uh, pinnacle of reaching a uh, methods maturity, know about, acquire and apply. You begin to benchmark things that you have acquired, you collaborate with people to really whether the benchmarking is the highest quality or not try to produce something which is uh, beyond a, a limitation of a one person or a one team and you deliver, you conceptualize this can be done, this is useful, this is needed and then you deliver. So once you are able to go through this process on a continuous cyclical basis, you attain the methods maturity. So what is this? What is the what is the what is the nature of this uh, method dimension? You have to understand this. People devise and people adopt on a continuous basis new methods or existing methods. They devise new methods if the existing method is faltering. They adopt the existing method if it is working. They don't care if it is simple or complex. So sometimes you know I have uh, I've heard the many saying okay uh, kiss principle or kiss method. I, I don't know what was it. I said it is a keep it simple and stupid. You know why it is necessary sometimes to reach out, uh, reach out to masses at a at a basic level 
of the need to be met to make it a KISS principle. Keep it simple and stupid. And people use that method. People will be, will be very happy to use it because it is very simple and anybody can understand. Sometimes you know you see that uh, instructions are printed on uh, some of the products that you use. Some of them it says okay you have used it once or twice or th third time you know exactly how to use it. You know how to open the bottle cap if you, know, you have to press it down if, if it is child proof uh, cap you have to press it down and twist. Very first time if you try to do that you will be turning and turning and you know what is happening I can't open the bottle because you are used to opening the bottle by just twisting the cap right. So then you realize it is not working and then read the instructions. It says please press down and twist. So there are the reason for that is to make it child proof because whatever the contents of the bottle can be consumed by a child without knowing what it is and endanger the life of the child. So then we devised a method to really counter that and the method is to devise a cap which can be opened only when you press it down. Right? So you end up in doing this kind of a devising new methods when the existing method will not work. So this pursuit, this pursuit of learning in method dimension has to be covering all these le learnings in four these quadrants as learning quadrants and cyclical in nature and also it has to be in continuous. And uh, thank you very much uh, for listening to today's talk. It is the most important dimension because it is a dimension which initiates change, which manages change and promotes change and that is for not only a limited to a person or an individual, it could be a change at a higher level, group level, organization level, societal level and the national level.